chancellors, vice chancellor, registrar, members of the governing council and senate of Africa's largest Baptist university, other university dignitaries, all protocols observed. It is an honor and a privilege to be given this opportunity to address you and the entire university community as your 15th convocation speaker. Let me thank you most sincerely for the recognition of my contributions through the award of an honorary doctorate degree. As the university approaches an important milestone, its 20th anniversary next year in 2021, there is no doubt that in the two decades of its existence, it has lived up to its motto of excellence and godliness, judging from the very positive image you have created of academic and other university activities. Let me congratulate you and congratulate all gra graduates for this great achievement. I have been asked to address the issue of what Africa's economy should look like post the COVID-19 pandemic. To do this, it's important to look at the health and economic impacts of the pandemic on the continent and ask ourselves, how can we seize the opportunity provided by this crisis to do better? How can we, to paraphrase a popular saying, not waste the crisis? Let me first talk about the pandemic and its health impact. This convocation address comes at a time when the COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented problems for our country, Nigeria, for Africa, and the world. COVID-19 swooped in like a bird of prey, sparing no one, rich and poor countries alike, and has carried away so many lives. As we speak, there are 46.6 million cases worldwide and 1.2 million deaths. After seemingly getting control of the situation through draconian lockdowns, several countries, including in Europe, are experiencing a second wave of infections, necessitating stringent health measures that, once again, are bound to have serious national and potentially global economic impact. In Africa, our cases number 1.78 million, with 43,000 deaths which translates to a lower number of deaths, 19 per 100,000 people, compared to a much higher 71 per 100,000 worldwide. While every single life lost is one too many, the relatively low death rate in Africa has taken everyone by surprise. In the absence of vaccines or therapeutics, containing COVID-19 requires three things, wearing masks, social distancing, and frequent hand washing. The latter two are very difficult in our urban slums where crowded living conditions and lack of basic amenities such as clean water are facts of life. So the expectation was that the inability to meet these conditions would ramp up the number of cases and deaths very rapidly. On a continent with weak health systems, where access to medical supplies and equipment is limited, and where, according to a McKinsey report, there are 0.25 doctors per 1,000 people, compared to 1.6 in Latin America and 3 in rich countries, and 1.4 hospital beds per 1,000, compared to 2 in Latin America and 4 in China. Large numbers of COVID-19 cases would have overwhelmed the system and been disastrous. Recall that even the rich countries with their better health systems could not cope. We were all surprised to find they did not have adequate protective gear, ventilators, or the needed number of hospital beds to deal with the onslaught of the pandemic. There are many hypotheses as to why the health impact of COVID-19 on Africa has not been as bad as expected. Some revolve around the youthful population, the median age on the continent is 19, and younger people seem to be less prone to contract COVID-19 or are less sick when they do. Some point out that due to our culture, we do not put our old people in care homes where they are more susceptible to the disease. Yet others posit that our exposure to malaria and other related illnesses may have something to do with our seeming ability to fight off COVID-19. Epidemiologists and other scientists are working hard to test the probability of these hypotheses. 
There is also no doubt that the prompt and courageous response of leaders on the continent, 44 of whom enacted immediate total or partial lockdowns, helped to contain the spread of the virus. Several countries also deploy lessons learned from Ebola on community education and involvement, contract tracing, and so on. Whatever the case may be, there is no room for complacency. The level of testing on the continent is low. According to the African CDC, we should do 20 million tests by the end of this year. But as at end September, we had only done 2.3 million. That means that it's likely that the number of cases on the continent is underreported. No one knows the trajectory of this disease. What it has shown us is that the interconnectedness of the world today means no one is safe from COVID-19 till the whole world is safe. That is why the importance of safe and efficacious vaccines and therapeutics affordably and equitably distributed to all countries in the world is paramount. If the health impact of COVID-19 on Africa has thus far been less severe than expected, the economic impact has been devastating. Africa is experiencing its first recession in a quarter century, and its development has been set back a decade. Prior to the pandemic, the continent was growing at about 4.5% per annum and was projected to grow at 3.2% in 2019. As a result of COVID-19, the IMF projects a 3% contraction in 2020. According to the World Bank, about 60 million people will fall into absolute poverty globally as a result of the pandemic, and almost 50% of them are expected to be in Africa. The pandemic hit Africa not initially as a health crisis, but actually as an economic crisis. As soon as China, Europe, and the USA experienced COVID-19 and implemented lockdowns, demand for Africa's exports plummeted, given the importance of these three as the most important destinations for our export of goods. Africa's economic structure remains largely unchanged, as the continent is still significantly an exporter of primary commodities petroleum, oils and gas, gold, copper, silver, platinum and other metals, cocoa, fruits and vegetables, fish and other agricultural products. Oil prices fell 60% between December 2019 and March 2020, driven largely by the COVID impact, but also by geopolitical tensions between Saudi Arabia and Russia. The price of heavy metals declined by 11% within the same period Though oil prices have rebounded and settled at about $41 per barrel, the IMF estimates a 32% drop in prices between 2019 and 2020. At the same time as the demand for exports fell, supply chains for key imports of medical supplies and pharmaceuticals and even food closed up as upwards of 90 countries slapped on restrictions on these exports. Africa imports 94% of its pharmaceuticals and despite its abundance of arable land, spends 45 to 60 billion per annum on food imports. Disruptions in the supply of these critical products drove prices up and added to inflationary pressures. There were additional economic impacts. Remittances fell. Africa now receives more remittances yearly than it does in aid. Nigeria alone is estimated to re receive a consequential $25 billion a year, and according to IMF estimates, net remittances to Nigeria dropped 40% in the second quarter. For 10 countries on the continent, range ranging from Lesotho and Liberia to Zimbabwe, remittances constitute an important 8 to 21% of GDP, making this a vital source of income for these economies. Tourism very important, especially for several Eastern African countries, also declined. The airline industry, estimated by the Economic Commission for Africa to contribute $55.8 billion to Africa's GDP and 6.2 million jobs, was hard hit. There was cap capital flight, 
estimated by the IMF at $5 billion between February and March 2020. Exchange rates came under pressure in virtually every country, with up to 25% depreciation in some countries. Africa's private sector was not left out of these difficulties. For enterprises big and small, there was a liquidity squeeze. Government payment arrears built up, and demand for products and services fell, as domestic demand also fell. According to a McKinsey report, manufacturing output on the continent is expected to contract by 10% or more, 10% or more than 50 billion in 2020. The arrival of the pandemic to Africa and the attendant implementation of lockdowns worsened an already difficult economic situation. Many formal sector workers lost their jobs as businesses closed or downsized. But a majority of Africans, especially those in urban areas, work in the informal sector, often earning their living on a daily basis. Many, in particular women, own or work for micro, small and medium enterprises. Mismis. The lockdowns had a severe impact on the mismis and therefore on the lives and li livelihoods of informal sector workers, especially women. Many could no longer feed their households and the saying, quote, we might die from the hunger virus before the coronavirus became popularized. So how did governments respond? Governments on the continent responded to the economic crisis in a variety of ways. Many expanded existing social safety net programs or created new ones to transfer cash, distribute food and other social support to vulnerable households. There was support to the agriculture sector to help avert a food crisis. With respect to businesses, a variety of fiscal measures were implemented, such as suspension of tax payments, clearance of government areas to companies, etc. To complement this, central banks offered liquidity lines or created special funds for micro, medium and small enterprises. At the regional level, leaders came together in an unprecedented show of unity to tackle COVID-19 as a continental problem. A fund was set up to support the Africa CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. Envoys, of which I'm one of seven, were appointed to mobilize additional financial resources for the continent's response. And an Africa-wide platform was set up for the common procurement of medical supplies and equipment. Laudable as these efforts are, they have been inadequate to tackle the full impact of the crisis. Africa's fiscal efforts have amounted to no more than 3% of GDP, of $53 billion as compared to about 5% of GDP for emerging markets and 7-8% to 8 or up to $12 trillion for advanced economies. African finance ministers estimated a financing gap of about $100 billion a year from 2020 to 2023. But response has been constrained by the lack of fiscal space in most countries. In the decade to 2020, many countries borrowed on commercial time terms from domestic capital markets and the eurobond market. Sub-Saharan Africa's debt-to-GDP ratio has risen substantially from about 26% of GDP in 2008-2009 to an estimated 65% of GDP in 2020. Six countries have debt-to-GDP ratios above 100% and are considered to be in debt distress. Perhaps even more important is the rising debt service to revenue ratios on the continent. On average, sub-Saharan African countries are spending 32% or one third of their revenues on debt service. Oil exporters are projected to spend an alarming 76% of their revenues on debt service in 2020, according to the IMF. Attempts to provide some debt relief through the G20-sponsored Debt Service Suspension Initiative, or DSSI, have not yielded as much benefit as was initially expected. The DSSI has only been implemented by bilateral creditors, and even then not fully, as not all have participated in a comprehensive manner.
Instead of the estimated $14 billion in bilateral debt service relief, only $6.6 .6 billion has accrued to Africa. Private creditors, to whom debt service is another estimated $17 billion, have thus far shown little appetite to be part of the initiative. There is little doubt that a more sustained approach to debt issues, including debt restructuring and relief, will be needed in the near to medium term if countries are to be put on the path to debt sustainability. In the face of these difficulties, and in light of uncertainties and associated downside risks surrounding possible future waves of COVID-19, the IMF projects a weak recovery in 2021 with a growth rate of 3.1% for the continent. This is lower than the projected global growth rate of 5.2%. As Africa recovers from the health and economic impacts of COVID-19, it must learn from the pandemic. COVID-19 has highlighted existing structural and institutional weaknesses of Africa's economy. But it has also cast a new light on existing opportunities and opened up new ones. Africa must seize on all these factors to refashion its economy and rebuild it with more resilience. Let me highlight six opportunities and approaches for refashioning a post-COVID African economy. First, industrialize Africa. COVID-19 brought into relief Africa's undiversified commodity-dependent economy. The lack of diversification relates to both products and sources of revenue. The African Union's Agenda 2063 seeks to industrialize the continent, and this objective remains as valid now as it has ever been. Africa must manufacture more through value addition to the raw materials it, it exports. The transformation of cocoa into delicious Ivoirian chocolates provides a good example. Much has been written about the continent's premature deindustrialization as a result of its inability to compete or keep up with changes in technology in the context of open markets. There is no doubt that African countries need to make the requisite investments in infrastructure skills and a conducive business environment. If businesses are to improve productivity, decrease unique cost of operation, and enhance competitiveness. The push for industrialization and value-added manufacturing will create good modern jobs for the continent's youthful population, whilst reducing exposure to volatile global commodity markets. The implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area will provide a large regional market needed to absorb these manufacturers, which will in turn boost intra-Africa trade, currently lagging at a low 15%. COVID-19 has shed light on the concentration in China of global supply chains for medical supplies and equipment. Countries have woken up to their vulnerability, and many, many are planning to reshore some of these supply chains as part of building resilience to future pandemics. As I said earlier, Africa imports 94% of its pharmaceuticals. This is huge for a continent with a population of 1.3 billion. COVID-19 should provide the opportunity for the continent to develop regional supply chains for pharmaceuticals. South Africa and Nigeria presently have some manufacturing capacity in this area and should boost this. Ethiopia has joined. There is a chance for the continent to also decrease the 45 to $60 billion per annum it spends on food imports by transforming agricultural products for the regional market and for exports. Let me add that diversification of Africa's economy should also include the encouragement of what some have termed smokestackless industries. In agriculture, horticulture is one such area already being pursued successfully by several countries in East Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, and Ethiopia. The creative industries, art, fashion, film, entertainment, are large job and income generators for young people and should be encouraged. Similar information technology, of which we shall discuss more below, is another area. Second, digitize Africa. <clears throat> 
One of the most interesting opportunities highlighted by the pandemic is the digital economy and society. Digitalization can spur innovation and enhance productivity, all of which is good for economic growth and development. The trend to digital was already there, including in Africa, but it has been accelerated by the advent of COVID-19. From e-commerce to education to health, to the way we communicate and share information, digitalization has taken rapid hold in our lives. There is no going back, and Africa must be part of this new economy and society. Our youth are poised to take advantage of the digital economy. They are far more connected than the rest of the continent. It's estimated that about 44% of them have access to the internet compared to 15% for the rest of the population. According to a McKinsey report, Afri quote, Africa has been experiencing far-reaching digital transformation. In re recent years, the continent has seen the world's fastest rate of new broadband connections, while mobile data traffic was forecast to increase sevenfold between 2017 and 2022. Close quote. In addition, e-commerce has been growing and becoming popular through online platforms such as Jumia. Though mobile money and e-wallets are now commonly used in many countries, there is still a need to develop capacity for online digital payments to underpin the growth of e-commerce. Regular trade in goods and services can also be rendered more efficient by digitalization of customs procedures on other aspects of trade facilitation. The African Continental Free Trade Area has a large chapter on digitization of trade. I do not have to tell you about the potential of digital channels for education. I'm sure you have seen what can be done during the period of this pandemic. The development of online learning can enable us to double or triple access at all levels of education and reach the difficult to reach, especially girls and women or other disadvantaged people in our rural and urban slums. The same thing goes for medicine. Telemedicine is already transforming the manner in which many of our young people consume medical services. For all this to work, there will need to be continued and sustained investment in ICT infrastructure. It is, it is estimated that both the public and private sector will have to spend up to $100 billion on key ICT infrastructure on the continent by 2030 to achieve universal broadband, broadband access. Mobilizing such a sum of about $10 billion a year is within reach. Third, prioritizing micro, medium, and small enterprises. Africa has an estimated 90 million micro, medium, and small enterprises, only 15% of which are formally registered. About half of these MISMIS are owned by women, and MISMIS create most of the jobs in the economy, albeit in the informal sector. A post-COVID African economy must include a concerted approach to assist these, medium, these micro, medium, and small enterprises help them integrate into the formal economy and access domestic, regional, and global value chains. Supporting business is good economics. It can help foster inclusion and bring women, youth, and other marginalized actors into the mainstream of the economy. Providing access to quick and inexpensive registration services can help entry into the formal sector. Providing access to grants, soft loans, and eventually access to banking relationships is key to help boost and strengthen the enterprises. Mentorship programs, training in quality control and marketing, as well as bookkeeping can help ensure that business owners can grow, create jobs, and manage success. An SME entrepreneurship program we fostered in Nigeria with these characteristics, known as UWIN, was a great success and created over 21,000 jobs. Once enterprises succeed and become grounded businesses, they can form part of the tax base 
thereby contributing back to the public purse. Of course, as a finance minister, this would be one of my objectives. Fourth, build infrastructure back better. A post-COVID African economy cannot grow unless there is continued investment in building and maintaining key infrastructure. Two-thirds of Africa's infrastructure is yet to be built, be it roads, rail ports, electricity, or broad broadband. Estimates are that the continent will require about $120 billion a year to invest in infrastructure. Part of the fiscal stimulus spending during this pandemic will undoubtedly be directed to infrastructure. It is important that such spending be focused on resilient, climate-friendly and sustainable infrastructure. <clears throat> Africa contributes only 2 to 3 percent of global carbon emissions, but it bears the brunt of the ravages of climate change. The continent can and should therefore be part of the solution to climate change. With respect to energy, the negative impact of carbon emissions for fossil fuels is leading to divestment from the latter and to rapid change in the global energy mix to cleaner sources, especially renewables. Oil majors have internalized this change and are increasing their portfolio of renewable energy assets. With oil and gas as one of the most important sectors in Africa's economy and a major revenue earner for some of the continents for some of the continent's largest economies. The question is, has Africa internalized this shift away from fossil fuels to cleaner energy? Has a post-COVID Africa that will want to improve energy access, especially access to electricity for the 55% of its households that presently have no access, devised a transition plan to cleaner energy? Such a plan should provide for multi-decade just transitions that will enable fossil fuel dependent economies to adjust. Without this, these economies may find themselves with stranded fossil fuel assets a few decades from now. Africa should also focus on job creating, climate friendly investments in natural infrastructure, such as soil restoration and reforestation that have significant payoffs for both the agriculture and climate agenda. Fifth, invest in human development. Investment in health and education, especially skills for the modern technology-driven economy will be key if the growth aspirations of a post-COVID-19 Africa economy are to be realized. We earlier mentioned Africa's weak health systems and their inability to cope with the exigencies of COVID-19. Africa needs to invest more in its health infrastructure, including in health workers and providers. Such investment should target women, among other priorities, since they make up 75% of our nursing workforce. Women have borne the brunt of frontline care for COVID-19 patients on the continent. It is estimated that only 10 countries on the continent have met the Abuja pledge of investing 15% of their budget on health. Of the 3% of GDP fiscal stimulus implemented by the continent to fight the pandemic, less than 1% went to the health sector. COVID-19 has shown us how health threats can devastate economies. It will be difficult to assure the rebound of regional growth as long as the health aspects of the crisis are not decisively handled. In addition, other health needs such as immunization programs which have suffered neglect as a result of the crisis, should receive due attention. Africa should learn from COVID-19 and make upfront investments necessary to innovate its health sector using digitalization and other modern yet inexpensive approaches to improve service. There is a parallel need to invest in education, particularly in the skills needed to navigate in a fast-moving technology-driven world. Africa's post-COVID economy needs the human development investment that can propel it to new heights. Sixth, improve governance, transparency, and accountability. 
Africa's young population is increasingly demanding better governance from its leaders, including transparency and accountability. Nigeria's recent NSAS movement is a good illustration of the desire for accountability. A post-COVID-19 modern African economy must be anchored on these values of open, transparent, and accountable governance. Governance that gives youth, women, and other marginalized people increased voice. An important aspect of transparency and accountability relates to the use of financial resources, including debt. Africa needs better and more transparent management of its debt. Such transparency engenders trust of citizens and facilitates better working relationship with partners. Africa also needs to exercise greater caution with respect to its rapidly increasing debt profile. The continent can ill afford repeated cycles of rapid borrowing, debt sustainability problems, and pleas to creditors for debt restructuring and forgiveness. In this regard, an important aspect as Africa builds back post-COVID, is the need to strengthen countries' abilities and tools for improved domestic resource mobilization. The financing needs of $100 billion per annum, estimated by Africa's finance ministers over the next three years, require external support in light of the extraordinary and unexpected impact of the pandemic. However, I can tell you, External resources are increasingly scarce and difficult to mobilize. Foreign direct investment has fallen off, and while international finance, finance institutions such as the African Development Bank, World Bank, IMF, and others have increased resource flows, particularly during the pandemic, these increased resource flows during the pandemic are insufficient to fill the continent's financing gap. This is why Africa must step up to transform its own economy, boost growth, and rely more than ever on its own internally generated resources. Vice Chancellor, eminent members of the university community, you asked me to speak on the topic of revisiting Africa's economy post COVID. I have sought to share with you in these remarks that whilst the COVID-19 presents a set of challenges, it also offers opportunities which the continent should seize to reinvent itself and its economy. Given what we have experienced under this pandemic, it cannot be business as usual for Africa. No, it cannot. Africa must transform. Africa must modernize. Africa must create a future that seizes the imagination of its young people and makes them proud of this continent they call home. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening.